Okay, well, welcome back for our third video in this series. I will uh, explain a little bit more about what we're actually doing in this series. And we've covered this in the previous videos, but in case you haven't seen any of those, this will explain, kind of catch you up to date. What we're doing here is we are going through the writings of early SDA pioneers to examine how they used the word person and variations of the word person. The reason we're doing that is because we want to understand what did they really mean when they said things like God has a personality or God is a person or God is a personal being, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, the reason we're doing this is because Ellen White mentioned that one of our pillar doctrines within the Seventh-day Adventist movement is the doctrine of the personality of God. Now, that's just one of our pillars, but the notable thing is, and this is a very important thing to be aware of, when you go and, and just do searches online for the pillars of the Seventh-day Adventist faith, most lists do not contain the personality of God as one of our pillar doctrines. But Ellen White did, and it's very, very important because she actually also said that the personality of God is everything to us as a people. And through this series of videos, we'll find um, other statements from her and other pioneers regarding that idea. And it will become more and more evident why it's such an important doctrine. Why is it everything to us as a people? And you might have never heard of the pillar doctrine of the personality of God, or maybe you have, but what do you believe that it means for God to be a person in the first place? That's what's really important. So, hey, we are just going through what the pioneers had to say, including Ellen White, what they had to say about what it means for God to be a person. And we want to make sure that we're not bringing any of our own ideas of what it means for God to be a person to this pillar doctrine, because if it's a pillar doctrine, obviously it's very important to make sure that we rightly understand it. Now on the screen there, you've seen that for a little while now, maybe you've already taken a peek and read some of it, but one of the reasons why I am doing this series in the first place on the articles by the early SDA pioneers is because Ellen White called for the reprinting of the articles by the pioneers on this topic. So as we go about this, we will um, see many of the early articles by early Seventh-day Adventist pioneers, and we'll get to find out exactly what did they mean by saying God is a person. Now, this episode is focused on Joseph Bates, and Ellen White mentioned that he was one of those who participated in the early meetings after the passing of the time in 1844, wherein these pillar doctrines were established. And as they studied and came to understand these pillar truths, she says that they accepted as light direct from heaven the revelations given to her. So God actually revealed to her certain things, certain pillar doctrines, mm -hmm. and um, they would come together and they would study. And they knew that she wasn't able to understand all of the reasons, all, all the answers to these passages in scripture that they were studying. But then she would be taken into vision and then God would reveal to her what the meanings of these passages were. And so they knew like, okay, yes, she didn't understand this before. They saw that she was in vision. They, they witnessed her while she was in vision. And she explained the scripture truths, which established these pillar doctrines, and they accepted it as a light direct from heaven. She says all the brethren came into harmony. So when she calls for the reprinting of the articles by the early pioneers, who were pioneers in this SDA movement, Joseph Bates was certainly among them. So reprinting his articles on the personality of God is something very much in keeping with what she called for us to do. Now, um, just as a very, very brief kind of bringing us up to date with Joseph Bates. Okay, so Joseph Bates was part of the Advent movement movement 
Uh, he joined the Adventist movement in 1839. That was the first time he heard William Miller's message. Now, of course, William Miller brought the first angel's message, which was announcing the uh, investigative judgment was about to begin. And that as part of that, very closely tied to that proclamation was the soon personal return and reign of Jesus. And we'll cover that a little bit more um, in a moment, but that was, uh, William Miller was the one who brought the first angel's message. And then we saw in the first video of the series, we saw that um, Charles Fitch was the one who brought the second angel's message in 1843. And once again, Joseph Bates was in this Adventist movement from that time. He participated in preaching the first angel's message and participated in preaching the second angel's message. But then even more directly, he was one of the key people that God used to bring the third angel's message. And in particular, he really was uh, the first to promote the keeping of the seventh day Sabbath in connection with the third angel's message of Revelation 14. And so, of course, we know that the third angel's message can just kind of be summed up as in it's important to not receive the mark of the beast and the way you don't receive the mark of the beast and instead receive the mark of God is that the saints keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So the keeping the commandments of God, part of that was the restoration within the Advent movement of keeping the seventh day Sabbath. Um, as we'll see from this next slide, this is an article printed in the Review and Herald, and it's pointing out that Joseph Bates was the first to commence the observance of the Bible's Sabbath understandingly in the light of prophecy. Okay, now he met James and Ellen White for the first time in 1846, like right after they were married. And the, James and Ellen White weren't yet keeping the Sabbath, but his pamphlet on the Sabbath, Joseph, that is Joseph Bates, wrote a pamphlet on the Sabbath and he shared it with James and Ellen White. And at first, they didn't think that it was important. Um, they didn't think that there was any need to focus more on the, you know, the fourth commandment as opposed to any others, et cetera, which, um, or, or that El, the way Ellen White puts it is that she initially thought that he dwelt too much upon placing emphasis on that. But then God gave her a vision, pointed out the importance of the Sabbath. And very soon after having their attention brought to the seventh day as being the Sabbath, by Joseph Bates' article, they started keeping the Seventh day Sabbath from that point on. So, really, Joseph Bates, James White, and Ellen White are the three main mm, pioneers, uh, people who started the Seventh day Adventist movement. And that was 1846. Now, but by that point, the personality of God had already been revealed to Ellen White in vision. She received that vision in February of 1845, if I remember correctly. And so when they had their meetings to establish these pillar doctrines, and among that was just settling upon the seventh day of the week as the Sabbath, and a host of other things that ended up becoming pillars of our faith, she says all the brethren came into harmony including Joseph Bates. So we are going to be looking at his pamphlet called The Opening Heavens. And um, we'll start with this preface, but the longer title is The Opening Heavens or A Connected View of the Testimony of the Prophets and Apostles Concerning the Opening Heavens Compared with Astronomical Observations and of the Present and Future Location of the New Jerusalem, the Paradise of God. Okay, that's quite the mouthful, but that is not unusual to have such a long title for these older writings. It's really awesome if you're um, familiar with some of these articles and books and their titles from the 1800s. It's really great. Anyway, so in the preface of his pamphlet, The Opening Heavens, we'll just refer to it as that, he explains what two of his leading motivations are or his leading motives 
which um, have actuated and guided him through this absorbing subject. That is the opening heavens and all that whole longer title, right? And notice what his second motive is. To correct or rebuke the spiritual views in respect to the appearing and kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay, so he his second motive in writing this is to correct or rebuke the spiritual views, right? Now, this is very significant for being able to rightly understand what he means by saying God is a person. Because in this pamphlet, he explains what it means for God to be a person. And since one of his motives for writing this book was to correct the spiritual views, having that piece of information will really help us to make sure we're reading his words in the right context. Now, he does add a little bit of extra clarity by also saying thousands who have been looking for the personal appearing of the Lord Jesus from heaven in these last days have, in their disappointment about his coming, given up the only scriptural view and are now teaching that he has come in spirit. And this is all we shall ever see of him here. Okay, so the thousands, you know, who had been looking for the personal appearing of Jesus, that's related to the first angel's message when William Miller was proclaiming that Jesus was coming back soon personally. And that was in contrast to the idea that he was coming spiritually. So as we saw in previous videos, that conflict between personally and spiritually has to do with physically or non-physically. Um, here is a little ex um, one slide from the first video, and this is in 1832. It's, it's a letter that William Miller wrote to the um, editor of the Vermont Telegraph, and he's quoting a little section from um, a non-Adventist minister, a very popular minister back in the day. And even there's a lot of people today who are still, you know, they, they know exactly who Reverend A. Fuller is. Um, Andrew Fuller, I think is his first name. But Andrew Fuller said, the idea of a personal reign appears to him to nearly exclude that of a spiritual one. So there's this antagonism between um, personal and spiritual. There's this conflict you know, one doesn't, you know, if you have one, well, then why do you need the other is the idea being expressed there. So what exactly, like more fully, what is the idea of the spiritual views? Because again, this is what Joseph Bates is wanting to correct by writing the article or the pamphlet that we're about to look at. So these quotes are from someone who promoted the spiritual views. He had been an Adventist proclaiming that Jesus was soon to come back in person in, in a physical sense. After the disappointment, when he didn't come back, when Jesus didn't come back in person, a lot of Adventists um, took the position that, well, no, he, we had the date right. He must have he must have come back. We just were looking for him to come back physically, but no, that's where we got it wrong, right? So anyway, so again, these two quotes, now they're from the same person, but he is not someone who became a Seventh-day Adventist. He was an Adventist who eventually adopted the spiritual views, okay? So we'll read this. This is from Voice of the Shepherd, 1845. So a year before Joseph Bates wrote and pub and printed um, the opening heavens. Okay. So this is under the heading, the coming of Christ and Solomon Fenton says, now I am unable to find one single passage in the Bible to prove that Christ will ever come in the body that he went away with. The same Jesus is not confined to the body. Okay. So again, this is the spiritual view. The same Jesus, that's a quote from the Gospel of Luke, when the angels are talking to the disciples who just watched Jesus ascend into the sky to go to heaven, 
they said, hey, don't worry, this same Jesus that you saw go into heaven will return in the same way that he came. So, but this guy, Solomon Fenton says, the same Jesus is not confined to the body. Then he points to 2 Corinthians 3.17, which is now the Lord is that spirit. And he says, if the Lord is that spirit, then the coming must be spiritual. Again, these are the spiritual views that Joseph Bates is wanting to rebuke or correct by writing the opening heavens. Solomon Fenton goes on to say, see also 2 Thessalonians 1.10, he quotes it, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints. Now, he put that in uppercase, so that's the way it was printed in the article. Then he goes on to add, not in a separate body, but in them. Okay, so that's the spiritual view that being glorified in the saints is actually not having a separate body, but being in the saints. So then in another article in the same publication of the uh, Voice of the Shepherd, under the heading Antichrist, Solomon Fenton writes, now I understand the time to be correct. And he means October 22, 1844. He says, I understand the time to be correct but we have been mistaken in the manner. So he's saying, oh, okay, well, then he explains it. <laughs> Instead of a literal personal coming, it is in the body of his saints, which is his flesh. So he's basically saying the idea of Jesus coming in the flesh doesn't mean his own flesh, not a physical, not a literal personal coming, but in the his saints, the saints, the body of the saints is his flesh. That's the spiritual view. And that's what Joseph Bates is wanting to correct. Now, Ellen White, we saw this in another uh, video, but she said she had frequently been falsely charged with teaching views peculiar to spiritualism. And then she identifies spiritualism as the teachings of the spiritual views. Okay. And she says that the spiritual views have sad and desolating effects upon people. And in contrast with the spiritual views, she says she has often seen the lovely Jesus, that he is a person. So to be a person, she's saying that she's asserting that as not a spiritual view. And she even goes so far as to you know, several times she identifies spiritualism as the spiritual views and says that the spiritual view takes away all the glory of heaven and that in many minds, the throne of David and the lovely person of Jesus have been burned up in the fire of spiritualism. So obviously these spiritual views are not something that um, early Seventh-day Adventists, Ellen White, Joseph Bates, or, or any of the others among the early Seventh-day Adventists, they understood that the spiritual views are not just the idea of the conscious state of the dead. It was the idea that Jesus' return was accomplished in a spiritual sense, a non-physical sense, not in his actual body, but instead they claimed that it was in the bodies of the saints. The saints were being indwelt in a literal sense by Jesus. That's the spiritual view. Okay, so let's now see what Joseph Bates did write as part of his attempt to correct or rebuke the spiritual views. Now, we already saw this from the preface. Again, that's just a quick reminder that this is one of his leading motives in writing this book or this pamphlet in the first place. And now we will move on to um, a further part in the book where he talks about what it means for God to be a person. So he says, um, you know what? I will just read 
through everything that I'm going to quote, and then we'll come back and we'll start again with some commentary. So he starts off by quoting John 5, 37, which is quoting Jesus. Ye have neither heard his voice nor seen his shape. Did Jesus contradict the patriarchs and prophets? No, no. He here told his persecutors what they had not seen nor heard. He did not say he had no voice or shape. Who did? First Moses, quote, And I will cover thee with my hand while I pass by, and I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Exodus 33, 22 and 23. Second, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry. The face of the Lord are against them that do evil. The Lord heareth. Psalm 34, 15 and 17. Again, the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. Does not this prove a shape, features, and voice ascribed to God the same as to man? Quoting, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Paul says of Jesus, who is the image of God. This can't be spiritually so. The firstborn of every creature, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Ephesians 2, uh, uh, 2 5 and 6. Now, I stumbled over that because I was like, I'm reading that wrong. That's not Ephesians, but that is how he printed it. That was just a mistake in his reference. It should have said Philippians. So that should be Philippians 2, 5 and 6. Now to the Hebrews. Quoting, Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, Paul says he is the express image of God. I understand him to say that he looks just like him. God the Father is a person and looks like Jesus and we like him. And God has a habitation where he dwells as the scriptures testify. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. Okay, so that covers the portion of his pamphlet that we're going to be looking at. So let's go back to the beginning of um, his article here that we started to look at. Not the preface, but the first part in pages, uh, starting with page 18. So he quotes from John 537, the words of Jesus. And then he kind of asks almost a rhetorical question, right? He's like, now, now, wait a minute. Did Jesus contradict the patriarchs and prophets? So clearly, Joseph Bates is under the impression that the patriarchs and prophets said something that would denote the idea of God having a voice or a shape. Because here, Jesus is recorded as saying, ye have neither heard his voice nor seen his shape. And he's like, did Jesus contradict the patriarchs and prophets? He says, no, no. He here told his persecutors what they had not seen or heard. He didn't say that God had no shape or no voice, right? So then he's like, well, like, did anybody? He's, he's like, so who did? So then he goes through Moses, right? And all of these italics are original to Joseph Bates' pamphlet. He points to the body parts that the scriptures um, portray God as having. And in Exodus 33, it records that um, God tells Moses, I will cover you with my hand while I pass by, and I will take away my hand, and you'll see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. So earlier, you know, Jesus says, you have neither heard his voice nor seen his shape. And here what Joseph Bates is saying is like, Jesus didn't contradict the patriarchs or prophets. He's just telling the people he's talking to what they have never seen or heard. That's what Joseph Bates is saying. 
So he quotes Exodus 33, 22 and 23, and then he goes on to quote from Psalm 34, which describes the Lord having eyes and ears and that he hears, right? So then he goes on to say, uh, quotes from Daniel, where Daniel had a vision and he saw the ancient of days. Now we know that the ancient of days is the father, not the son. The ancient of the day, the ancient of days, um, Daniel saw sitting. He was wearing a garment and he had hair on his head. And then Joseph Bates says, does not this prove a shape, features, and voice ascribed to God the same as to man? Then he quotes from Genesis 1, 26 and 27, where mankind was made in the image of God. And then he quotes from Paul, who says that Jesus was the image of God. And notice that Joseph Bates says, this can't be spiritually so. In other words, being the image of God in this passage, Paul is not referring to Jesus being spiritually in the image of God. He says this cannot be spiritually so. So Paul says Jesus is in the image of God and was in the form of God. Then Joseph Bates points to the book of Hebrews and quotes, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his, the father's person. Then Joseph Bates says, Paul says Jesus is the express image of God. And he's very clear about what he thinks Paul means by that. In parentheses, Joseph Bates adds, I understand him, Paul, to say that Jesus looks just like his father. So it's a physical appearance. Being the express image of his father's person relates to the physical appearance, the way Jesus looks, not just something to do with um, character traits or anything of a non-physical nature, right? It's pointing to the physicality, what image of uh, God's person is referring to a physical form, a physical shape. Then he wraps up by saying, God the Father is a person. So this whole time, he's been pointing to the fact that the scriptures portray the Father as having a shape, having a form, not spiritually so, but physically so. You can see it. Um, Moses saw parts of God's body and heard his voice. And other prophets in vision have seen the father, the ancient of days, sitting down, wearing clothes, describing the hair on the father's head, the ancient of days head. And he says, God, the father, Joseph Bates says, God, the father is a person and looks like Jesus. And we look like him. Then he also says, God has a habitation where he dwells. In other words, God has a localized position in space and time. God dwells in a particular location. He has a habitation where he dwells, and then he points to the scriptures as proof of that fact, that John saw the holy city coming down from God. So it came from a location where God is, from God out of heaven. So again, all of this is very physical. It's all materialistic. In other words, it's made up of matter. It's not anything in a spiritualistic sense or any of the uh, shared views that were part of the spiritual views. Because again, the spiritual views, as we saw, were what he's trying to correct or rebuke. And the idea of the spiritual views of Christ's coming and his kingdom is that it's a non-physical sense. That's what the spiritual views are. It's a non-physical sense. So that means the idea of God being a person is in a physical sense. Now, when you read the writings of the pioneers on the personality of God, you'll notice that they would often end with Hebrews um, 
1 verse 3, the, uh, the, the part there about Jesus being the express image of his father's person. They liked to end with this as their proof text for showing that God has a material, physical form. In fact, in one of the issues of the Review and Herald, you had kind of like this little question and answer segment in that issue. And there's the question, what is meant by the express image of his person? So that's from Hebrews 1 verse 3. And the answer, super concise, very clear, very to the point. Their answer the express image of his person means material resemblance. A strong proof text in favor of the personality of God. So when we want to understand what did the pioneers teach about the personality of God, this piece of information is a really key point I mean, it's just so direct, so powerful, material resemblance. There is really no misunderstanding that, right? Okay, now um, notice what Ellen White says in The Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 2. She's quoting from, or she's, you know, at least referring to Hebrews 1 verse 3, where she says, the Son of God was in the express image of his Father, not in features alone, but in perfection of character. Now for her to say not in features alone shows that obviously features was part of it. And she's having to say here, hey, Jesus was didn't just have the same type of physical features that his father had, but also he was in the express image of his father in regard to perfection of character right? So that's pretty clear. That's pretty powerful. It includes the express image of his father includes being in a material resemblance of features, but not just features, also in character. She goes on to write, before Christ left heaven and came into the world to die, he was taller than any of the angels. Now, being taller than another being is a property of matter. Something immaterial means it doesn't have any physical properties. It is not material. Material things have properties like height, width, you know, color, texture, aroma, whatever. There's um, physical properties to things that are made up of matter. And height is one of those physical properties. So before Christ left heaven and came to the world to die, he was taller than any of the angels. Well, that also implies that the angels have the property of height, which means that they're also material beings. Ellen White goes on to say Jesus was majestic and lovely, well, before Christ left heaven. So he wasn't even known as Jesus yet, but he was majestic and lovely. But when his ministry commenced, he was but little taller than the common size of men then living upon the earth. So first we have the comparison of height between the pre-incarnate Christ and other beings, other heavenly beings known as angels. But then after he became human and his ministry commenced, so he was grown up by then, you know, he didn't have the same majestic physical features as he did prior to coming to earth. When he was in heaven, he had the physical features of, you know, this exalted height, but not while he was on earth during his earthly ministry. He was a little taller than the common size of man than living upon the earth. Okay. So these are all very physical descriptions of both the pre-incarnate Christ as well as the incarnate Christ. She goes on to say, had he come among men with his noble heavenly form, 
right there. He had a form in heaven prior to his incarnation. Had he come among men with his noble heavenly form, his outward appearance, again, very clear, his form, his heavenly form had an outward appearance. And, and if he had come looking like that, that outward appearance would have attracted the minds of the people to himself and he would have been received without the exercise of faith. It was in the order of God that Christ should take upon himself the form and nature of fallen man. So that's a very similar thing to prior to coming to earth when Christ was in heaven, the son of God was in the express image of his father, not just in features alone, but also in perfection of character. And when he came to earth, he had to come and give up his heavenly form, be made in the form and nature of fallen man. The faith of men in Christ as the Messiah was not to rest on the evidences of sight. Again, that's why Jesus didn't come to earth with his heavenly form, his heavenly um, outward appearance, something that could have been seen. Mankind was not to believe on Christ as the Messiah because of what we could see, because of how majestic and spectacular he looked. It's all very physical, right? That's not what belief was supposed to be based on, not his outward appearance. And they believe on him because of his personal attractions. Now, right there, that shows us what she meant by personal attractions. She's all this time writing about how Christ just was not able to come to earth with his heavenly form the way he looked outwardly, his physical appearance when he was in heaven, those are his personal attractions, his person, his body, his form, his shape, his appearance. She's saying the faith of men in Christ as the Messiah was not to rest on the evidence of sight and they believe on him because of his visible personal attractions his sight, his form, his features. No, it was to rest on the evidence of his excellence of character found in him. So in other words, she's contrasting him, uh, contrasting the terms personal attractions against the idea of character traits. So personal isn't just referring to something like how kind or benevolent someone is. That's not what she means by personal attractions. Personal attractions is his physical form, his body, his person. I think that's pretty clear, but you know, sometimes you have to really think about these things so well, long enough for it to really sink in because what's taught today is that God's person is not restricted to the bodily form or shape. Just like Solomon Fenton said about Jesus, that this same Jesus is not confined to the body. Well, that's what people today, even amongst the Seventh-day Adventist church, that's what people say today about God's personality, God's personhood. It isn't confined to the body. God himself is not confined to a physical form. That's the spiritual view. And that's the idea that Joseph Bates was correcting or rebuking by saying that um, God is a person and looks like Jesus and we like him. Being in the express image of God's person means having the same physical appearance bodily. So when we go through Joseph Bates articles and we see how he described what it means for God to be a person, we can see that he was using the word person and its variants to refer to a physical material 
bodily existence and that it's not like the spiritual views say that he's not confined to a bodily existence. That was what Solomon Fenton said. So anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this episode of going through Joseph Bates and some of Ellen White's statements. And the next time we're going to be looking at articles by Uriah Smith, and we'll see how he used the word person and its variants in direct connection with this pillar doctrine within the Seventh-day Adventist movement known as the personality of God. Again, something that Ellen White said is everything to us as a people. And again, we can't cover everything all at once. There's a whole lot more to share with you regarding what Ellen White said and what many other pioneers said. So you'll want to be sure and come back for those future episodes. So blessings to you. Bye-bye.